reading is from Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the evening breeze, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent tricked me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, Cursed are you among all animals and among all wild, wild creatures. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put en enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head, and you will strike your heel. The word of the Lord. So last Wednesday was the 74th anniversary of D-Day. D-Day was the invasion of France at the end of, towards the end of the Second World War, and as a World War II history buff, I have always enjoyed like reading stuff and watching documentaries and learning all about the planning that went in to the D-Day invasion. Now, the D-Day invasion was a success, and it's remembered as a major turning point in the war. But the planners knew that it was definitely not a sure thing. In spite of the bravery and the skill of all the soldiers and the sailors, it could easily have gone wrong. There were a lot of logistical details, any one of which could have sunk the whole operation. And so one of the, one of the stories that you may know of, it's a sort of a side story of D-Day, is that right before the invasion, Dwight Eisenhower wrote a note that he intended to read publicly in case the invasion failed. And the note was forgotten about because he stuck it in his pocket to have it on hand and after the invasion was a success, he didn't need to think any more about it, and it was eventually found by somebody doing his laundry. But the note said that everybody involved in this operation, all the soldiers and the sailors, did everything they possibly could. They were brave, they were skilled. The best information possible was used in order to make this operation a success. But the very last thing he said in the note, the very final thing he ended with, was he said, if any blame or fault attaches to this attempt, it is mine alone. It was a remarkable note. It was remarkable because it, for all the other things that could have gone wrong that legitimately would have had blame, Eisenhower decided that whatever happened, whatever went wrong, finally in the end it was his decision and he was going to take the blame. He wasn't going to pass the buck to anybody else. Especially in today's political environment, that is unheard of. Everybody of all political persuasions and parties is only too happy to tell us how everything is really somebody else's fault. Somebody else is to blame. Everything is not my fault. But in fact, it's not just today, and it's not just politics. Human nature has always been something that calls us to think about how something really isn't my fault. It's really somebody else's fault. It is human nature to want to pass the buck. And today's first reading, from the very beginning of Genesis, is a story that illustrates to us what human nature is and how human nature messes things up when things go wrong. In this second of the two creation stories in Genesis, God has created Adam and Eve. And he's placed them in the garden with everything that they possibly could need. They have it all. There is no need to worry about anything. He gives them one, just one rule. You know, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't do that one thing, and everything else you're fine with. But that one restriction, because when we're, whenever we're told just one thing, just don't do that one thing, we always want to think, hmm, I wonder if I should do that one thing. And they're thinking about that, and they're clearly hurt by the fact that God tells them not to do this thing. And the way you know that they're clearly hurt is a few verses before this story when the snake comes up to Eve and he starts talking to her about the fruit of all the trees. He says, well, can you eat of all the trees? Well, she says, yeah, we can eat from all of it, except we can't eat from that one or even touch it or we're going to die. Touching the 
fruit is not part of the instructions. He, they can touch the fruit, but that's how you know it's clearly irking them. So the devil says probably, you know, the serpent says to her, you know, if you are, if you actually eat this fruit, your eyes will be open. You will be like God. And that's the little nudge that Eve needs to go and eat the fruit. And Adam sees that Eve gets away with it. So he gets in on the act too. And then God comes looking for them and says, what's going on here? And from the very beginning, they decide that they're going to pass the buck. So Eve says, well, the serpent tricked me and I ate. This is the first ever recorded instance of somebody saying the devil made me do it. So, you know, that's the snake's fault. Adam has a more complex way of passing the buck. At first it sounds like he's blaming his wife, and he is. Well, the woman you gave me, see, she gave me the fruit, because you know what, God? Here's the thing. It's actually, you know, God, it's actually your fault. <laughs> the woman you gave me, see, if you had planned this operation better, if you, had, if you had thought out creation, you wouldn't have put me in this situation. So, God, it's really your fault. The thing is, passing the buck, it didn't work for Adam and Eve doesn't really work for anybody else either. What we sometimes think of as original sin, because this is the story that talks about original sin, we sometimes think that original sin is about Adam and Eve eating the fruit, doing the one thing, you know, doing something God said, don't do that thing. Or sometimes we think about original sin as, as you know, sort of being infected because we are all related to the people who broke that one rule. But original sin is really not about breaking a rule. It's not about eating fruit. Original sin is about messing up relationship. It's about messing up your relationship with God, messing up your relationship with each other, messing up your relationship with the world around you. And that's what Adam and Eve are doing in deciding that they want to be like God, that they want to be God, that they're going to pass the buck so that they can be perfect people and, and sinless and blameless instead of God. And it's in that messing up of relationship, actually, the passing the buck is the illustration of how the relationships have now been all messed up. Because in general, passing the buck is a really great way to mess up your relationship with other people. Try to throw somebody under the bus, see how it goes. I mean, can you imagine how Adam and Eve are going to have a conversation the next morning when Adam comes up and says, Hey, Eve, how you doing? After he's just tried to throw her under the bus. That ain't going to work so well. <clears throat> Passing the buck is a good way to mess up your relationship with yourself. Because if you've decided, even in your mind or your heart, not even out loud, that, you know, whatever trouble I got into, it was really somebody else's fault. Somebody else was really to blame for this. And you never kind of look at yourself you never say to yourself, what, what part of me got myself into this? What was it that I did that opened myself up to being tempted to do something that I knew I wasn't supposed to do? What part of me really wanted to do this, and I just needed that little bit of nudge? You never learn. You never grow. You mess up your relationship with yourself. And ultimately, it's how they mess up their relationship with God and how we mess up our relationship with God. Adam and Eve are separated from the presence of God not because they make a mistake, but because they insist that they are right and God is wrong. And that's what ends up being the big separation there. They don't even ask for forgiveness. This ancient story of creation calls us to remember that even though we are human beings created and loved by God, we inherently want to be God instead of loving God. And that tendency shows itself through wanting to pass the buck and the blame on everybody and anybody but ourselves. Inherently, human beings mess up relationships like that. And the prescription for that original sin isn't to stop being human or to pretend that that's not really our problem. That's sort of just another way of passing the buck. The prescription that God gives us is forgiveness. But the thing is, many people understand forgiveness as God going, well, okay, I'll let it slide this one time. And I'm going to remember it. I'm going to hold it against you. And I'm going to keep a grudge. That's how we experience forgiveness. Or maybe forgiveness is about trying to pretend that I don't remember it ever happening. 
but that's not honest either. Forgiveness really is not about those things. Forgiveness is about actually having renewed and restored relationships. The point of forgiveness is not to pretend that a bad thing didn't happen, but to continue to have a loving, caring relationship with someone in spite of all of that. So what God is trying to do in forgiveness is to continue to have a relationship with us, to have us be able to be in relationships with each other that continue to be loving and caring, renewed and restored. And therefore, forgiveness is not simply about going, oh, all right, fine, and then walking away. Forgiveness is sometimes hard work. Forgiveness requires practice. Forgiveness requires a daily struggle against that kind of original sin that always wants to pass the buck and break down those relationships. So in some ways, the forgiveness that God calls us to and the forgiveness that Adam and Eve weren't even asking for is a kind of new and restored relationship about seeking God's help and God's guidance instead of trying to blame others. Whether it's other people, the devil, or even blaming God for letting me get into this mess. You know, part of the, the reason for some of these ancient stories and, and their inclusion in the stories in Genesis is to cause us to think about, uh, and, I, and I learned this from, from talking to rabbis about these stories who always want to think about what's the story, what's the story mean, how, how would the story end otherwise? Um, how would the story have ended if Adam and Eve, instead of trying to blame each other and the devil and God and everybody else, how would it have ended if they had said to God, you know what, we made a mistake. We're sorry. Forgive us. Help us to do better. Give us a second chance. Could it have been different if they had sought God's support, God's help, instead of just trying to pass the ball? And that's part of what living into forgiveness is about for us as well. Part of living into forgiveness is about taking responsibility for our own actions, admitting our own mistakes, our own participation in the kinds of systems and problems that, that even if we do not intend to be in, we find ourselves caught up in anyway. And doing whatever it is that we can, not to pay God off, not to be perfect, not to cast the buck, but simply to try to make the world more the kind of place that God wants it to be. So, in the, uh, when, we study, when we study confession and forgiveness and confirmation, I often you know, refer back to the kind of the, series of penance that Luther dealt with in the Middle Ages and, and the, the jokes that are still made today about uh, you know, Catholics that go to confession. I, I got five Hail Marys and four Our Fathers and all these kinds of things you're supposed to do to make up for whatever sin you did. But the real purpose of all of those kinds of things originally in the church was simply to say if you have done something wrong, if you have, if you have hurt a relationship that you have with God or with somebody else, do whatever it is you can do to help make amends for it, to make it, to, to heal it. Not that you can do that perfectly, and, and how perfectly you do it is not going to mean God's going to love you or not love you. It's just a matter of, you know, if you stole something from somebody, go give it back. If you insulted somebody, go say you're sorry. If you hurt somebody, try to help them out. Make amends for it. It was about making the relationship holy. That's what forgiveness is really supposed to be about. And living into forgiveness is maybe most importantly about trusting that God is more interested in renewed and restored relationships than he is in perfection. See, Adam and Eve get caught up in what so many of us get caught up in. I've got to show that I'm good enough to stand in front of God. And God doesn't care about that. What God cares about is that people actually live in a good relationship with him and with one another. And if that's the goal, then we can give up trying to be perfect, trying to be better than each other, or trying to pass the buck for the blame. Because you know, the desire to pass the buck is always going to be part of our human nature. But as Christians, we're called to live in a way that doesn't rely on passing the buck, but rather relies on forgiveness. And when we get into forgiveness, we show the world a different way to live. We show the world a way to live in which we take responsibility to do the things we can in order to make the world more like the place God intended it to be. 
when we live into forgiveness, we show the world a way to live in which we don't have to demonize other people anymore. And when we live into that kind of forgiveness, we show the world a way to live in which, in the end, we see God's help and God's strength, instead of relying on our own strength and on our own righteousness.